thanks. Well, thanks. Thanks, everybody, for showing up for the talk. These Zoom talks are kind of hard to take, but uh, I'll do my best to try to keep your interest. My talk is going to be on, on Cauchy sequences, and the subtitle is more on topic than the title. It's, it's a case study of how computability and subsystems of second order arithmetic uh, come together. Now, I wasn't, uh, when Dennis put out a call for talks, uh, I wasn't an enthusiastic uh, volunteer. But Dennis, Dennis uh, per, you know, wrote to me and he said that uh, you know, it doesn't, the talk doesn't have to be on, on new material. That was one of my concerns. And secondly, you know, I could say something uh, to people who haven't seen me talk before. And it could even be some sort of philosophical ruminations and reflections. So I had my my response to that was uh, twofold. First, the first thing I thought was, oh well, Dennis has uh, heard that I'm planning to retire, and he's given me a little bit of slack here on the on the kind of talks that I can give as a as a newly uh, established pensioner. And then my, my second thought was, well, it's, it's Dennis. You know, we're friends. He asked me to do it. So, so uh, I'll try to put something together for you. So I was uh, impressed by Harvey's talk the other day. And uh, among, among other things, by the, by the comment that he made to motivate some of the material that he was discussing, and uh, the motivation that he gave was that he devised it in order to impressed some of his colleagues during the math department coffee hours. So I thought about that a, a bit and then I thought, well, in this meeting, this meeting we're going to share. It's, it's, an, it's a safe space to, to share our true motivations. And uh, so in that spirit, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the motivations for this talk. So there's, when I was thinking over the material, I recalled three conversations, which happened over different, you know, at, di at different points in time with different people, three different colleagues. So, they, and they all sort of come together in, in the kind of material that I want to discuss. So colleague number one contacted me recently and said uh, to me, you once told me that you don't believe in the big five. We're writing a book. Can, can we quote it about that? So my, my response to that was, was quite simple. Yes. Yeah, I, I don't believe in the big five. I, I don't, you know, it's, it's like a John Lennon song. I don't believe in Elvis. I don't believe in the Beatles. I don't believe in Jesus. I don't believe in almost anything. But I certainly don't believe that, that uh, in, the, in the big five is the overarching organization for mathematical thought. And this mathematics is full of insights and particular theorems right, are distillations and, and instantiations of insights that, that go into them. Right? So there's, there's, a, there's a very wide and uh, as well as deep uh, subject. It's, it's uh, there are a lot more than five insights and a lot more than five, five principles that one can evoke or patterns of thought that one can, can apply to uh, solve mathematical problems or understand mathematical phenomena. And so definitely, definitely you can quote me on that one. Colleague number two. Well, if you don't believe in the big five, how about just, you know, it's, it's, in large parts of math, right? Uh, the big five are, are the, the pillars, the pillars of, the, of, of what's going in, what's involved in analyzing those pieces of math. Like uh, in, in, uh, in advanced calculus. So by advanced calculus, I mean that something like uh, a first course out of Rudin's book or Math 104 at, at Berkeley, it's the topology of the real line uh, 
things like that. The, the pure math part of, of an introduction to analysis. So it's it's true that this, I mean, this is a much reduced scope to go from all of math to, to just the math that's covered in a particular undergraduate course. That's a big reduction in scope. And that those courses, those preliminary analysis courses are designed for beginners, right? So they don't, you don't overwhelm, overwhelm the class with all sorts of, of new, uh, new ideas, new, new patterns, new, new information, right? It's really try to teach them what you can in one semester. But even so, even so, my reaction to this statement was, was similarly uh, simple. No, I don't even believe that. That that in that even in in an elementary first analysis course, that uh, there's only there's only uh, five five patterns of reasoning, five five uh, insights, and they're uh, they're just repackaging. The theorems are just repackaging one after another of those basic principles. I don't think that's true. Okay. Third, the third one is more of a methodological uh, memory uh, rather than a, a comment about uh, a big five or something of that sort. So this is colleague number three said to me, reverse math is a foundational program. And I'm disappointed that the people who got interested in it are recursion theorists and they see it just as a source for technical problems. And my reaction to this was, was more nuanced. I would say, uh, you know, it's twofold, a twofold reaction. So the first, the first part of the reaction was, uh, what? <laughs> Are you kidding me? It's, it's uh, recursion theory is, is not reverse math, but it does, it is a part of mathematical logic and it does try to analyze and isolate and understand the means by which mathematical objects are uh, specified by, by the tools and, and techniques that can be used to understand those objects. It's, it's uh, the limitations of the tools, the necessity of those tools. It's uh, It is an attempt to understand things, right? It's it's uh, and you know and the, using the ingredients and the methods that are involved, right? To to analyze problems from the point of view that I just described. So that that seemed like that that had been missed. Then th that brings me to the second to the second. This is a twofold reaction. So the second part of the reaction was was more personal, because after. Actually, I am, I am a recursion theorist, right? And this, you know, colleague number three was saying this, saying this to me, you know, to my face, and uh, I, it felt a little weird, you know, like, uh, what is this person saying you know, that I'm a kind of amoeba, blindlessly, soullessly, oozing my way from one forcing argument to another priority argument, you know, driven by some sort of primitive hunger. I, I don't know. It felt felt strange. You know, I was sort of like I was in a movie. You know, the, the characters had already been established and now there was some sort of dramatic prelude, right, to, to set up the final conflict. So I thought about that for a while. Like which which movie was it? And I finally, I finally uh, figured out my second reaction here. Whoever double crosses me and leaves me alive, he understands nothing about Ted Slayman. And if you haven't seen this movie, it's, it's uh, the movie, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. And the character who delivers that line uh, is Eli Wallach. It's a fantastic movie. And uh, it's worth re-seeing if you've, if you've seen it before. And if you haven't seen it, you're lucky. You can still see it for the first time. It's a terrific film. Okay, so that's the motivation in, in a nutshell. 
And let's see uh, the, the kind of case study that we're going to follow. So to remind you, so we're talking about sort of elementary uh, analysis, advanced calculus. So in that context, a sequence this is a sequence of real numbers. It's called a Cauchy sequence. If and only if for every epsilon greater than zero, there is a point in the sequence in L, such that any two elements of the sequence after L are within an ep a distance of epsilon from each other. Okay. So that's a Cauchy sequence. And then the, the basic fact is that a sequence of real numbers is convergent if and only if it's Cauchy. Okay. So that's a that's a uh, well-known well known fact. Okay, now I want to look at this, this uh, business of Cauchy sequences. So I went to, to look uh, online and I found the following, the following uh, explanation. Why is it that Cauchy's that the Cauchy sequences are uh, important and and what's the point of this characterization of con being convergent? So Wikipedia says. The utility of Cauchy sequences lies in the fact that in a complete metric space, right, the criteria for convergence depends only on the terms of the sequence itself, as opposed to the definition of convergence, which uses the limit value as well as the terms. Because that's from Wikipedia. Now, there's a, I found a couple of other interesting comments that, that are made. You, know, you can look for yourself if, if you're curious. Uh, there's some notes for, for, the, for the undergraduate analysis class at, at Harvard by Noam Elkies, and he says about Cauchy sequences that uh, the property of being a Cauchy sequence is intrinsic to the sequence. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, rely upon in any aspects of, of completeness of the ambient space in which the sequence is being uh, evaluated. So how... how uh, can we quantify those kinds of statements? Right? So recursion theory is good for this. Right? Here's the, here is a quantified version of, of the Wikipedia statement. Right? So first of all, let's notice the sequence Xi uh, is convergent is a sigma 1, 1 statement. Right? It says that there exists, there exists C such that C is the limit of the sequence of Xi's. Okay, that's the that's the talk that's the mentioning of the limit. To say that the sequence is Cauchy is a pi zero three statement. Okay. Let's let's go back pi zero three statement for all epsilon, and this could easily be rational epsilon. For all epsilon, there is an L such that for every i and j something happens. For all exists for all. It's a pi zero statement. It's a statement in arithmetic. So. Analytic statements are much more complicated than arithmetic statements. So there's a big reduction in type. Secondly, uh, the set of recursive indices for Cauchy sequences of rational numbers, if we want to be, we don't want to worry, you know, if we want to put it purely in the language of the finite, the set of recursive indices for Cauchy sequences of rational numbers is a pi zero three complete set. Or if you look in the space of Cauchy, of sequences, right, of rational numbers, then the set of Cauchy sequences, a set of sequences that are Cauchy, is a pi zero three complete subset of Q to the omega. Okay, so it's it's a pi zero three property, right, and that property cannot be simplified. It's a it's pi zero three complete. So the the uh, the index set, the, the property of a sequence as being convergent, you know, a sequence of reals being convergent in the real numbers, right, is best, you know, whenever you prove an index set result, whenever you observe you know, some fact about some property is pi zero three complete, it is a pi zero three property and it's complete at that level, that tells you exactly, well, you have the simplest possible means to describe or to characterize the property that, that you're examining. Right? And so if you want to prove that a sequence is convergent, you should prove it's Cauchy, because that's the simplest formulation of the concept that you could probably that you could possibly try to verify. So if you look at the Wikipedia article, it sort of explains that. It explains that lots of lots of uh, arguments 
rely on, on convergence as being equivalent to cauchiness because cauchiness is a lot easier to, to analyze in the applications. Okay, so you have some, some kind of property you can identify, and that's a recursion theoretic theorem. You can identify what's the simplest way to, to uh, specify that property. Okay, so let's consider this statement. Uh, every infinite totally bounded sequence of rational numbers has an infinite Cauchy subsequence. Okay. This is a typical uh, fact. In fact, you can, you can uh, characterize what it means for a set to be totally bounded by just saying a set is totally bounded if every sequence of its elements has a Cauchy subsequence. That has nothing to do with, with completeness. Ted, uh, yes. Steve has a question on chat. I don't know if you can see it. I can read it to you. It's, it's complete in the sense that, you know, that there's a continuous function that maps an arbitrary element with a pi zero three predicate to another, to another element such that the pi zero three statement is true of the, of the argument, if and only if the image uh, is Cauchy. Okay, so the question was, what does it mean for a for a uh, a set to be a pi zero three complete subset of Q to the omega? So that's what I meant by that. Okay, so now let's look at this statement. Every infinite totally bounded sequence of rational numbers has an infinite Cauchy subsequence. Okay, so recall the standard proof, okay. which which have a, a, a quite a cool proof. It's very it's short, but it's it's all. Uh, it's perfectly nice. So we're given some sequence. Right? But it's, it's totally bounded. We might as well assume it's a subsequence of, of uh, the unit interval. So we have a sequence of rationals from the unit interval. We're going to define use recursion to define a subsequence. Namely, uh, we're going to build some x sub i n for n and omega. And i n is an increasing sequence of integers. And we're going to also build an auxiliary sequence of nested intervals, these i sub n's. Okay. So we, and then we're going to ensure that uh, at every step along the way in our recursion, this is our inductive property, uh, there are infinitely many elements from our initial sequence that belong to the uh, interval i n. Okay. Okay, so here's the, and here's the induction. The first element of our sequence is just going to be the first element of the given sequence. And our first interval is going to be uh, the unit interval. Okay, so the sequence is infinite. It comes from the unit interval. The induction hypothesis is fine. Step n plus one. We've already specified our sequence up to the you know, up to i n, and we've got some nice dyadic interval, right? That has length one over two to the n. Then we're going to divide that interval i n into two halves, right? The first half and the second. We'll take our interval to be the first half of i n if the first half of i n contains infinitely many x i's, and if it, if it doesn't, then we'll take the second half of of i n to be i n plus one. If i n contained infinitely many of the x i's. It can't be the case that, uh, you know, in the union of these two possibilities is all of i n. One of those two pieces has to contain infinitely many of the x i's. So i n plus one satisfies the inductive assumption. And then let's just let x i n plus one be, be uh, such that it belongs to i n plus one and it's, it comes later in the sequence from everything that we had so far. That's the usual proof. Okay, so it's some, it's some, uh, you could say it more abstractly that there's some sort of epsilon net and we're choosing, choosing an element of each, at each point out of the net and so on. But, but this is fine for the, for the uh, discussion. Okay, so let's make a couple of observations about this proof. Uh, first of all, I claim that the proof produces a subsequence uh, which is recursive in a in the double jump of the uh, of the first of the given initial sequence, and secondly, the proof uh, guarantees it, it's it's specifying that the Skolem function for being Cauchy right, 
is uh, satisfies this property, right? That if you want to be less than, if you want the subsequent elements to be less than one over two to the L, you only have to look at the sequence after the first L elements. Okay, that's how the proof worked. All right, so let's just check this double jump. Right, it happens right here. When we're deciding what to do in the construction, we have to know whether the sequence intersect here is infinite or the sequence intersect there is infinite. Okay, so this is a, a pi zero two statement, and that's a, in, in the initial sequence. This is pi zero two for every n there exists at least n many elements, or, you know, or the pi zero two thing is false, and then we can conclude that it's true down there. Okay, so there's, there's an explicit mentioned in this recursion to some two quantifier uh, property in the inductive description of the subsequence that we're trying to find. Okay, so that's that's uh, the standard proof. You can optimize this proof a little bit, right? Which for, first, first you can prove that there is a recursive sequence, recursive total subset of the unit interval totally bounded sequence, which has no recursive Cauchy subsequence. Okay, so there is some, we, here we went to the double jump, but there is some essential undecidability here. Right? The, it's not uh, completely trivial. You can't pr always produce a recursive uh, Cauchy subsequence, but you can do better than the standard proof. You can, you can uh, give it any sequence recursively in the, in a single jump. You don't need to look at two quantifiers. You can look at one quantifier, produce a Cauchy subsequence that's recursive in a single jump of the input. Okay, so that's, that's um, I said it's an exercise. Basically, that's, that's about the size of it. And the, in the, uh, the interesting, the only interesting thing about when you think through this exercise, if, if, if you do, uh, the interesting thing that happens in the uh, in this second part, right, is if you want to reduce the the complexity, you want to build a or exhibit a, a Cauchy subsequence of a given sequence. There are two things that that uh, you can de deconstruct what what's necessary to do there into two parts. One part is you have to say what the elements of your subsequence are. Okay, clearly you have to specify the sequence. And secondly, you have to guarantee that it's Cauchy. But you don't have to do those things. Uh, those two things need not have the same complexity. It's one thing to, to specify the point-wise values of this sequence, and it's another thing to guarantee that uh, it has this uh, eventual, that the sequence has an eventual behavior. Okay, so one thing is specify the points as you go. The other thing is ensure that something happens in the limit. Right? There's, a, there's a one quantifier separation there. So you can pull down the, the description of the sequence without necessarily pulling down the way in which the sequence has the desired properties. Okay? So that's a typical application of the priority method, which is, which is uh, how I know how to do this proof. Okay. So let's, let's uh, continue with our discussion of this case study. So let's put C into context, okay? So that means, right? So let's view it in the, in the you know, and compare it to other, other uh, statements in second order arithmetic. Okay, so the standard proof, C is provable in ACA naught. Okay? The standard proof shows that. Right. The standard proof shows that if that's given the sequence, you can in, in two jumps read off a Cauchy subsequence. Consequently, if you if you have arithmetic comprehension, you can conclude uh, that C must be true. Of course, there's loss of information. This is not something that's a new insight to me, but there's loss of information in going from the analysis we just did to this statement, right? Because we actually showed something a little sharper that, that not only can you show that there is an arithmetic Cauchy subsequence, you can show that there is, there is one that's recursive in one application of the Turing jump. Okay, however, the relationship uh, between C and ACA naught is not symmetric. 
here's the uh, here's a theorem. Okay, suppose that that uh, T is an infinite computable subtree of two to the less than omega, and it has no infinite computable path. Okay, then there is a set S contained in two to the omega such that the following conditions hold. This is a sort of standard. I'm going to read it off, but then this is a sort of standard format. So. Uh, S forms an ideal in the Turing degree. So S is closed under join and relative computability. Uh, S has the property that it satisfies C. If you have a, a, a sequence, uh, I should have said totally bounded. Sorry about that. So if you have a totally bounded sequence of rationals that's computable from an element of S, then it has a Cauchy subsequence, which is computable from an element of S. So, so the reals in S, that these, two, these two conditions say that um, S satisfies, S viewed as a set of reals over the standard, uh, not over the standard numbers, uh, satisfies C. Every totally bounded uh, sequence of rationals has a Cauchy subsequence. However, then so this part says you're, we're making C true, and this part says uh, we did not make uh, we didn't add an infinite path through T. Okay, so there is an omega. We've we've exhibited an omega model of uh, C such that uh, it has a, an infinite. There's an infinite recursive tree. Uh, binary, which has no uh, infinite path inside this model. Okay, so RCA naught plus C does not prove weak Kernick's lemma. C is provable in ACA naught, but it doesn't have much strength. It doesn't compared to the big five. Right? It doesn't it doesn't prove weak Kernick's lemma. In fact, it doesn't prove weak weak Kernick's lemma. And I think that there's even a weak 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 Kernick's lemma, and it doesn't prove that either. Anything that has to do with Kernig's lemma doesn't prove it. So, okay, so it's it's uh, it doesn't seem to have much strength. On the other hand, uh, oh yeah, so let me say something about this this uh, proof since uh, I didn't write anything about it. Uh, well, that's funny. Somehow the automatic vacuum cleaner just turned itself on. Okay. All right, so, so something about the proof here. Uh, the typical, there's a, there's a, a uh, this is a, a well, a well-traveled uh, road to, to uh, proof theorem, you know, to come to conclusions like this one. Namely, what do you do? You have to find a, a way to make instances of C true without uh, computing paths through recursive trees. So I want to make an instance of C true, and I want to maintain the fact that there's an instance of weak Kernig's lemma that, that still remains false. Okay. And the, the, the way that you normally do that uh, is you look at a generic, a generic version of uh, Make of make and see true. So it's, how did this standard proof go? Well, well, we specified two things. An initial at each step, we specified an initial segment of our Cauchy subsequence, and we specified an interval in which all uh, subsequent elements of the sequence must must reside. And we we said, and we did two sorts of things. Uh, we extended in our recursion, we extended our construction to add more elements to our sequence, right? and also to thin, to thin the interval from which subsequent elements must be chosen. If you do that generically, right? if, you do, if you don't do a construction, but you just look at that, those two things as a partial order, and you take a generic object for that partial order, uh, that's exactly how you, how you prove this theorem. Okay. Okay, so that's that's the strength of C, and it's it is what I would call an effective forcing argument. Okay, 
the difficulty of C. So C, C may not have may not be strong, but is it easy to prove? Right. And so here is a here is the second theorem, and has exactly the same form as the previous one. Uh, there is a recursive sequence, and there is a a subset of two to the omega, right? such that the first two the first two clauses here just say that W is a is a Scott set. Right? It's closed under join and recursive in, and it satisfies Koenig's lemma. If, if T is an infinite binary tree, which is recursive in an element of W, uh, and it, then it has an infinite path, which is recursive in an element of W. So those two things say that, that uh, W is a Scott set. And so W together with the, with the natural numbers uh, is a model of uh, Weed Koenig's lemma. Okay, and then, then, uh, however, yeah, they, they go ahead, Dennis. Said, yeah, Wei Wang is asking in chat, does C follow from Co? Oh, yeah, let me just state this, state this, and then I'll, I will uh, see if I can respond to that. Okay, so then, so we have a W is a Scott set, and, uh, and yet in, inside W, there's, there is uh, no infinite Cauchy subsequence for this original uh, recursive sequence of X of I. Okay, so that in particular RCA naught plus weak Koenig's lemma does not prove C. And again, right, this is a this is a weak form of what, what we've shown. We have an omega model. Omega model, uh, we don't need that zero there. The omega model satisfies full induction. And, and not just, you know, it satisfies induction, period. Right? So it's a much stronger, a much stronger fact than uh, what's what's said here axiomatically. Yeah, so the question, you know, the questions about C, does it follow from Co? Uh, I didn't, you know, actually don't, didn't, uh, didn't think about that question. I thought a bit about does it, does it follow from the existence of, of Cohen generic reals? Uh, it seemed to me that it's incomparable with, the, with that, but I'm a little, uh, I was traveling last week. I'm a little, still a little jet lagged, so I, I'm not really confident of any results like that. So I, I don't really know. And th this was this was uh, does it? Yeah. So then, and Demir asks, does it imply anything at all? Uh, I don't really know. You know, it's th this was this was. Uh, I worked this out for this talk, so I haven't really investigated C thoroughly. But I encourage you know it's it's a it is an interesting uh, it is an interesting principle and so anybody who wants who who is curious about it I encourage you to think about it and let me know what you find because I would uh, I'd appreciate anybody else taking interest in it okay but so it, what I do know is that it's incomparable with weak Kernick Um where it fits in otherwise I don't know yet. Okay, so that's that's uh, C. It's it's not it's not strong in that in comparison to the to Weak Kernig's lemma, but it's it's not weak either. It's uh, it's just different. But you know, this is an inclusive audience. We, we've got room for lots of different principles. Okay, so now. Let me make a couple comments about about those. Oh yeah, I, I forgot. I should say something about the proof of this theorem. So the proof of this theorem is a little bit different than. So in the previous one, what did I say? I said suppose T is an infinite computable subtree with no infinite computable path. Then then so take any tree. Then you can make C true and avoid adding paths through that tree. Here I said there is a sequence. And, uh, and a Scott set, so that the Scott set has no Cauchy subsequence of the original sequence. So I didn't, I don't, you know, this was the best I could do. I had to build in, in to prove in the proof of this thing. The only proof I know is, is build the sequence and the Scott set simultaneously. And, uh, to have the properties that are mentioned in the theorem, and the proof here is a is a priority argument, right? So it's 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 a priority argument to 
to uh, sort of like, uh, well, I don't know what it's sort of like. It's, it's a priority argument in which you have to build the sequence recursively and approximate how, how it is that you're going to build the Scott set. And you can build, so locally, when you, you can build a, a Scott set by building just a single, a single, uh, you know, there is a universal uh, pi zero one class, right? So if you build a, if you build a, a, a non-centered model of PA, you've built, you have built a Scott set. So you can build one non-standard mo model of PA and a sequence so that, that the presentation of that, of that model does not compute a Cauchy subsequence of the original sequence. Okay. All right, so, so, so we've seen one priority argument and one, one uh, effective forcing argument. Um, hopefully though, it's not soulless and blindness searching for those things. They just are the way that the theorems are proven. Okay, so the follow, that that way of analyzing things, building these ideals in the in the Turing degrees and looking at omega models is. Yo, there, in, uh, there is another remark in the chat. Let's see. Does this work? Do something, and then. Well, you know, it's this. That's something that that. Uh, I can't really answer the, whether a particular proposed proof is going to, to work in real time, but I'm happy to talk about it after the talk. If I try to do something in real time, I'll just mess up. Okay. Okay. So the previous results follow uh, a well established recursion theoretic pattern of comparing pi one, two statements by looking at their omega models. Okay. Good. And uh, recursion theory has evolved over time, right? To give insight into exactly these kinds of situations, right? Can can you, you know, can you build an object? Can, is is something? Is there something like this that is recursive? Does every one generic compute something like this? Does every one random real compute something like that? Right? Can you get a one random real out of this situation? That's that's the way that recursion theory works. I mean, it's. It, it, it has evolved techniques. It's developed techniques to give insight into those situations. And so it's, it is the, a means to, to understand exactly these kinds of implications between pi one, two statements. And I'm not the one who, who thought of formulating it that way, but it's true. Okay, now, on the other hand, uh, subsystems of second order arithmetic have, it gives an extremely clear view of, of that kind of, of that, those sorts of problems of that terrain. And, and, and reverse math has, has been critical in uh, establishing important reference points in, inside uh, that collection of problems or that, you know, that collection of uh, statements. So it's, it's, uh, you can look at the, you know, some animals in the zoo are more important than others. I guess that that's my, uh, that's my thought about that. Okay, now I wanna turn finally to, to um, the next thing that one wants to, when you, when you think about some uh, second order principle, you know, what Steve calls a set existence principle, the, uh, you want to compare it to others, and then you sort of want to think about uh, it in in other ways. And one aspect of the situation that doesn't immediately come under the umbrella of recursion theory is that recursion theory works with omega models. Right? It takes the natural numbers, uh, or you know, it's I don't really care about the data type that much. It takes the natural numbers or the hereditarily finite sets or whatever sort of finite objects you want to work with uh, as given. And formal systems, you know, axiomatics, right? Provide a context in which to investigate whether these infinitary principles have consequences for finite sets. Recursion theorists is not, you know, when we look at the notion of computable function or a Turing ideal or something like that, we've already taken as, as given what it means for something to be a, to be a, uh, a natural number, 
we can't really distinguish, but we can't tell whether some statement about this about the natural numbers is true based based on purely recursion theoretic thinking because we can't change the theory of the natural numbers. It's already determined. However, uh, it is possible to, to use the, these lines of thinking to look at questions about of this sort, whether infinitary principles have con consequences for the finite sense. Right? And the, the first example that, that I, or the, the one that I find extremely compelling is uh, Harrington's adaptation of the low basis theorem, the, you know, Jokic and Soar's theorem that every pi zero, non-empty pi zero one class has a has a low element uh, to non-standard models. Right? So he he Harrington noted that the the recursion theorists uh, construction of a set while controlling what sigma one statements are true about that set, like in the low basis theorem, right, is, is uh, analogous to somebody who's trying to add elements to a model of induction, right, sigma one induction, and preserve sigma one induction after the addition has been accomplished. Right? In each case, you have to control the existential quantifier. Right? And you're doing it. You're doing it to show that well, you can understand how the existential quantifier works when the set is low, and you can understand how an ex how the existential quantifier works in a generic extension, if uh, if the forcing relation to build that generic extension is suitably uh, tame. Okay, so that same that same uh, method applies to C. Right. You can show that uh, for any countable model MR, which satisfies RCA naught, uh, there is a, you can expand the model by adding sets. There is an S that contains R such that uh, MS satisfies RCA naught plus C. So it's so that tells us that um, RCA that this. The Cauchy statement that every totally bounded infinite sequence has a Cauchy, Cauchy subsequence is conservative of our RCA not for pi on one sentences. Doesn't give you a new number theoretic content as is measured by this uh, criteria. Okay, so that's that's and this and you know so what's this argument? This argument is. Uh, an adaptation, right? It's an adaptation of the effective forcing argument to a non-standard model using uh, this thing that was sort of uh, pioneered by Leo Harrington. Interesting though, I don't know, uh, maybe somebody can answer it in chat. I don't know whether, uh, so the, the usual thing, like I said, was that it's typical that you take a recursion theoretic argument which produces a low set, right, or produces a low two set or something of that sort, and you you then move to a an argument like this where you preserve sigma one induction. If the if your recursion theoretic construction builds something low, you preserve sigma one induction. If your recursion theoretic construction pr produce something low two, you preserve sigma two induction. And in th this particular argument, though, I don't know whether whether uh, given any totally bounded a recursive sequence of rationals, there is a low Cauchy subsequence. I don't know whether that's true. So it's a, it, this, this situation deviates a little bit from the norm, but the, the, uh, the paradigm is, is, is still in play. All right, good. Okay, so I'm almost done here. I have two more slides. So let me make a couple of personal uh, reflections before I quit. Uh, the first one is, uh, it's, it's true that recursion theoretic investigations are not foundationally motivated. Where I think of foundation is, I may have a too limited, when I say this, I may be uh, may be doing a disservice to the word foundational. Uh, 
if you think of foundational as trying to give the foundation, you know, I don't know, foundational, give, provide a foundation or say what it is that underpins the subject. I don't think most recursion theorists are, are uh, looking at what's the nature of computation. You know, it's, we're taking some of those things as already, as already understood and looking at how those things work. So I don't see that as being a purely foundational enterprise, but I do think it shines a bright light on the subject matter. I do think that the methodology of recursion theory can tell you quite a lot. Uh, you know, and in this case study, you can see sort of tried and true methods that, that uh, recursion theorists uh, apply. Okay, secondly, uh, I, this is my own personal, uh, I was, you know, was writing on these reflections and with longing, I thought to myself, oh, I wish I had been able to apply more math meta mathematics in this area. It's, uh, it looks like it should be full of meta mathematics. Now it's, it's, uh, but mostly, you know, it's mostly the things that, that uh, seem to, to do the trick are things like we've just saw, which I don't think of as meta, -meta, meta mathematical. I think of them, uh, they're not going beyond math, except for the extent that we use the mathematics of definability. Uh, okay, yeah, so Steve asked me more meta mathematics. Well, you know, like abs absoluteness arguments between models of set theory, non-standard mo non models of arithmetic, uh, things of that sort. I mean, Harvey has done a lot, a lot of pushing, pushing out uh, the context in which you can get finitary uh, consequences out of infinitary principles. You know, I wish you know, I had done some. I wish I had done more of that. I'd like to see more things like the Paris Harrington theorem and things of that sort. Okay. Finally, uh, this is a personal plea to the audience. Could somebody please figure out the set of first order consequences of Ramsey's theorem for pairs? It's on, uh, I, at one point I really wanted to figure that one out myself. Uh, now I just want anybody to figure it out. Uh, there's been a lot of beautiful work especially recently, but uh, this problem still, unless somebody has solved it since the last time I heard about it, but um, I would really love to see this particular technical problem solved. Okay, with that, that's, that's my, the last of my content. Uh, going back to, to uh, Dennis's, having heard that I retired, I think I'm gonna go back to uh, my, my favorite retirement activity. And uh, but I'm I'm willing to hang around for a while for questions. So we'll now move to questions. Is there any questions? Yeah. Yeah, I have one technical question. So you prove this by one one conservativity or this existence of Cushion subsequence, so um, for one uh, RCA not. Uh, and uh, you, you made this analogy with this uh, conspiracy to prove for big Koenig uh, But so there are, I think, essentially two different um, conspiracy to prove, at least two different conspiracy to proofs for big Koenig slammer that do this model theory construction, namely this in the slow basis theorem one and the forcing based one. Um, so I mean, to do to, uh, force with perfect trees. And the, but there's some essential difference between the two proofs, uh, namely that um, as a, uh, this uh, um, low basis theorem based proof actually produces an interpretation of uh, WKL0 in I sigma 1. So basically, you can, when you formalize this in arithmetic, you could just make an interpretation uh, uh, that actually even preserves natural numbers. But I, I think actually forcing based proof doesn't give you this, so it's a bit more complicated. You need to do iterative forcing, and this is uh, not directly formalizable in arithmetic. So this is, uh, you, you, still, uh, you still get this model static uh, that can be, you could extend models uh, of RC naught to models of RC uh, to, of WKL naught, uh, but this is not, not really internalizable, but this low-based theorem 
uh, based proof actually is fully internalizable. Yeah, so uh, with your results, is it more like uh, do you get this internalization or not? Yeah, sorry, the, the, talk, the question was a little garbled. It, it just in the audio, and I couldn't, I couldn't uh, hear a lot of it. Okay, so, so, sorry, I, I took my quite a lot. But okay, so basically, my question is: uh, Could you produce an interpretation of RC naught plus C in I sigma one by your method? <laughs> It's possible. I don't see it directly. Yeah. So, so I, I mean that you get this from low basis theorem. So you could actually. Mm, yeah, I so think not too high. I believe, but I'm not precisely sure. But yeah. yeah. I and mean, there is one difference, which is is that, uh, you know, like I said, the uh, the recursion theoretic situation is slightly different in that I don't know a low basis theorem for C. Oh, I, I don't. I don't know that every that every uh, totally bounded sequence of rationals has a has a uh, Cauchy subsequence such that the jump of the Cauchy sequence is recursive in the jump of the original sequence. That may be true, but I I didn't see it come directly out of the proof. But you know, I, I don't know whether that's true. Thank you. Peter. So Ted, what's your uh, dream solution to the last question? <laughs> In this one? Yeah. I don't really know. For 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 some time, I thought it was it would be B sigma two, but uh, my dream my dream. I guess if you're if you're asking for a dream. Uh, since I don't believe in the big five, I also don't believe in the big arithmetic hierarchy. You know, it's it's uh, my dream would be that it's somewhere intermediate between sigma two bounding and and uh, sigma two induction. Yeah, you're talking about Ramsey's theorem for pairs in two colors, right? Correct. Some fixed number of colors. Correct. Yeah, fixed number of colors. Yeah, so it's I mean, but lots of things are known about it, right? It's known. Uh, Rudebeck and, and Keda characterized uh, a fragment of the first order consequences of Ramsey's theorem for pairs, but the full the full uh, Ramsey's theorem for pairs in two colors, but the full thing isn't known there. Oh, Ramsey's theorem for pairs and finitely many colors that that one's known, but but specifically Ramsey's theorem for pairs in two colors. I see. Um, so with the uh, uh, motivating memories, uh, in, in the third one, you told us uh, what you thought about uh, the characterization of recursion theorists, uh, but you didn't tell us what you think about the characterization of reverse mathematics as a foundational theory. Uh, so I was just wondering if you wanted to say something more about that. Like you got a little bit into what you meant by foundational here, um, but yeah, where, where do you think reverse mathematics rather than recursion theory stands on, on that? Let's see. I did. I think maybe, maybe I uh, I slipped that by. You know. So I I think reverse math, right? I mean, so there's there's different parts of. Yeah, you know, I'll tell you what. So as a preamble, uh, it's against my code to to make. Uh, philosophical statements or sort of sweeping commentaries about mathematical practice. And the, the reason is, you know, I admire people who can do it. Uh, but for me, I, I start off saying something that's supposed to be uh, philosophical or, or, you know, to, to use, to just put a word on it. And I end up saying something that's self, you know, self-aggrandizing or self-serving and and uh, then I don't like myself for doing that but uh, but I'll try to answer the question as best I can uh, the thing that that uh, so I think so first I spent a lot of time working on questions that are phrased in the language of of reverse math 
which I tend, but I tend to think I'm, it's not the reverse part uh, that uh, for me is most attractive. It's the math part. And the, the uh, so I tend to, to think I'm not re really working on reverse. I'm working on the mathematics of, of second order arithmetic. And, it, and that has come up now under the, to be, to be, I think, identified, that whole realm has been uh, identified with the phrase reverse math. And there, I think it's a really interesting and important part of mathematical logic. You know, so it's, it's, uh, it sort of covers, I like to, to think it's covering the, 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 uh, the part of mathematical logic, which is absolute between well-founded models of set theory. So set theorists have, a, and set the, the set theoretic apparatus, right, is, is uh, fantastic, just fantastic for looking at the theory of the projective sets or, or uh, combinatorics on, high, on, high, on sets of higher size and so on. But in the realm of, of, of pi one two, those things are, the pi one two statements are absolute between models of set theory, well-founded models. And, uh, and yet there's very interesting mathematical content there to try to understand because that's a lot, a lot of the mathematical experience is in that realm, right? And there, this subsistence of second order arithmetic seems to me to be uh, an extremely, uh, productive uh, way to, to uh, get clarity about uh, principles that are all provable in ZFC, but and live and live in this realm of, of countable, you know, countable, clo countable closure operations or you know, the existence of real numbers with certain properties. So I think there it's, it's a fantastic, it's a fantastic uh, device. I'm not so I'm not so convinced about you know as, as you can see I'm not so convinced about the reverse part because uh, but you know it's okay if if to the extent that we can to take combinatorial statements or or topological statements and so on and phrase them uh, in in one common language so that they can be compared to each other you know. Good. You know, the language of logic is perfectly good for that. It's supposed to be, uh, it's supposed to be capable of doing that job. And uh, okay, you know, to to that extent, reverse reverse in the sense of unifying the discussion uh, seems seems quite uh, productive to me. And you know, kudos to the subject for for uh, giving us. Uh, a context in which to in which to analyze this kind of statement and uh, you know, and some early important reference points. So I think it's good for that. Well, on that note, let's uh, end the meeting and thank again the speaker.